Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Come into the presence of God who provides everything we need. God's faithful love lasts forever. Let us praise the Lord who makes a way where there is no way. God's faithful love lasts forever. Follow the shepherd who leads us into life in beloved community. God's faithful love lasts forever. Come and worship our loving triune God who calls us to live in God's glory. God's faithful love lasts forever. You may be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, you promise us that nothing can come between us and your saving love in Jesus Christ. We want to believe, O oh God. Help us understand our doubts. We want to believe, O oh God. Help us overcome our unbelief. When we forget who and what you are to us, forgive us and humble us, we pray, that we may touch your forgiveness and love. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 36. Um, you can find it on pages 24 to 25 in your pew Bible. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. For you do not go into, in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind gods, who say, whoever swears by the sanctuary is bound by nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by the oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that has made the gold sacred? And you say, whoever swears by the altar is bound by nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar is bound by the oath. How blind you are! For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar, swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the sanctuary, swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by the one who is seated upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, so that the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets, sages, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town, so that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bacariah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come upon this generation. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. 
A thank you for that beautiful, powerful, and inspiring anthem. And we really needed it after that scripture lesson. <laughs> we find in Jesus' woes to the Pharisees some rather harsh and pointed words. It's a side of Jesus that we don't often talk about. We don't put it in little greeting cards from Hallmark. And uh, we probably don't talk about it in Sunday school too often, lest the kids get the wrong image. <laughs> but we find in this passage a powerful part of Jesus of Nazareth. For he does indeed speak harsh words. I'm mindful of Proverbs 16, 23, and 24. The mind of the wise makes speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to their lips. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the body and the soul. I think of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. Words spoken by the wise bring them favor, but the lips of fools consume them. The words of their mouths begin in foolishness, and their talk ends in wicked madness, yet they talk on and on. This seems to be a season when harsh words abound. And I must confess every now and then I'm quite torn to either uh, repeat those harsh words and contribute to the increasing anxiety that we are all living with, or trying to have some sense of comfort and to de-escalate the anxiety that we're all living through. And I'm not quite sure what is the appropriate pastoral thing to do. But I guess we all just live with the anxiety of this present moment. I think of the words of one of my intellectual and spiritual mentors, Frederick Beekner, who wrote, words spoken in deep love or deep hate, set things in motion in the human heart that can never be reversed. Well, let me set for you the stage of these harsh words that come from Jesus' lips. It is in the very last week of his life, as Matthew tells the story. He's been to the temple and he's had his uh, uh, time there of driving out the money changers. He's lived in Jerusalem for a few days and he's locked in bitter conflict with the leadership of the city. The stage as it's set by Matthew would probably be Jesus standing on the rabbi's steps. That is a, a set of steps near one of the walls of the temple where people would speak and gather to be heard. And right above the steps of the rabbis would be the office complex for the scribes. There's no air conditioning in ancient Judea in the first century. The scribes' windows would have been open. 
they would have heard each harsh word that Jesus spoke. I imagine if this were a Facebook post, the caption would be, Jesus' epic takedown of the Pharisees. But these harsh words that we find in Matthew's gospel do not appear in Mark's gospel. Mark is written in the year 70 AD, and Matthew's gospel is written somewhere between 85 and 90. This leads many scholars to conclude that the tension we see between Jesus and the Pharisees in the Gospel of Matthew probably reflect the tension that exists between the Christian church and the synagogue some years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So that the animus that we discover here is not Jesus and Pharisees as much as it is the conflict that emerges between the church and the synagogue. The construction, woe to you, is meant to mirror the construction we find in many places as blessed. Just as blessed means you're better off now because. Woe means you'll be in trouble later. Blessed means you're doing the right thing in the right moment for God's future that is yet to unfold. Woe means that the behavior you're involved in right now might be expedient and helpful in the, mo in the present, but in God's future, it will prove to be a liability and unwise. Jesus is not taking issue with the Jewish faith in and of itself. Jesus is taking issue with a perceived corruption in the leadership at that particular moment in time. The Jesus we meet in these woes is someone who's angry. Angry that the spiritual yearnings of a people are being betrayed. If we could set some limits on how it is we ought to use these words and understand them, we would be a wiser people. I don't believe that what Jesus says here should ever be universalized, that is, taken out of its context and applied everywhere. And it's too bad that the church has done that over many, many centuries. We have drawn unfair caricatures of Jewish people from these texts and those unfair characterizations have led to horrible and deadly behaviors. Let me give you an example of how I think we should understand these sections. I have a sister who's about a year and a half older than I am, and we grew up together, and in our relationship with one another, we learned certain things about life. I said things when I was 12 years old about my sister. <laughs> 
that I really wished I hadn't said. <laughs> and she said some things about me that, that, that I kind of wish she hadn't said. And if our parents had heard us, they would have washed our mouths out with soap. <laughs> but that's a part of how one grows up that we often discover our identity and through a process of trial and error, through mistake and misjudgment and clarification. And the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees in this chapter of Matthew's Gospel might be best understood as a developmental journey and not universalized. Just because I said something about my sister when I was 12 years old, it doesn't mean I have to keep saying it now that I'm 57. <laughs> Jesus accuses them of hypocrisy. Which reminds me of my favorite church ad. Are you tired of all those hypocrites at your church? Come to our church and you can meet a bunch of new ones. <laughs> I don't mean to make light of hypocrisy, but it really is inevitable that we will all be hypocritical from time to time. It's not hard to imagine why. We dare to set for ourselves the example of Jesus of Nazareth as the goal and the aspiration and the highest ideal for how we live. And that is a high bar. And we really do need one another to goad us on, to encourage us, to challenge us and to inspire us to do better than we would do all on our own. And while we attempt to do all of that, we are flawed human beings. And fear and anxiety lives inside us right along with all of our hopes and our aspirations and we do our best and sometimes we fall short we don't always live up to our highest hopes that's not an excuse to be lazy in our spiritual journey. But it is the promise that because of God's nature, we are forgiven. We are free to try again, even when we fail. Those words that come to us from the Gospel of Matthew need to live within a set of limits. They are not universal. I'd also say that under those harsh words, there is a burning hope expressed by Jesus. When you read through all of them, you cannot help but distill that at the base of Jesus being upset and angry, there is a powerful passion that the religious enterprise ought to be worthy of the human aspiration for holiness. That part of Jesus' disappointment is because he knows that we can do better. And if we want to use those woes in a way that is redemptive, we can judge ourselves by them and not judge someone else by them. How am I like that? 
What might I do differently? Because a stately building with a clean carpet is a very poor substitution for a kind greeting, for a warm smile, for an honest conversation. And the religious enterprise that does not have at its core a sincere, positive regard for the well-being of every other human being <clears throat> is disappointing to Jesus. And it should be disappointing to us as well. I wonder if you'd be willing to try something with me this morning. Can you go back in your mind's eye to a time when you spoke harsher words than you intended? Can you remember what emotions animated your speech? Did you say what you intended? Or did the energy limit your ability to express yourself as completely as you'd like? And if you can stay in that uncomfortable spot for just a few more moments, Ponder this question. Is there anything you can do about that now? And if so, resolve to do it. And if not, let it go. Trust that in the mystery and the wonder and the majesty of God, all is forgiven. All will be well. Words spoken in deep love or in deep hate, set things in motion within the human heart that can never be reversed. Amen. <laughs>